As I mentioned this morning, I'm going to be preaching this evening about our new challenge. Now, I normally do this prior to the month actually beginning, but this is the first day of the month, so um, we're going to be preaching on our April challenge. And of course, the April challenge this month is a prayer challenge. Now, we did this same exact challenge one year ago in March. We had our prayer challenge, and I have not changed the rules at all. So I'm going to go over our rules. We have them listed in the bulletin briefly. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in our prayer challenge. And if you remember, you know, as we continue to do these challenges every month, the goal is for you to focus on one aspect or one area of your life, of your spiritual life, that we can improve, that we can work on. Now, it doesn't mean that you stop doing everything else. The goal is to try to push ourselves to do even more. So just because we're focused on prayer this month doesn't mean, well, I'm not going to go soul winning because I'm focused on prayer. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop reading my Bible because I'm focused on prayer. No, the goal is to do even more. It's to, be, it's to exceed what you normally would do. So keeping that in mind, as I go over some of the requirements to meet our challenge, I think this is a very, I think it's a very simple challenge. I think it's pretty easy. I actually think if you can't meet this challenge, then you're probably not even right with God. And the reason why I say that is because if you can't spend, the, the, the requirement for this challenge is to spend at least 15 minutes in prayer with God uh, every day. If you can't spend 15 minutes in prayer with God, there's something wrong with you. It's just like spending 15 minutes in, in reading time and in, in reading from his word. That is not a very high bar to push yourself to, to pray for 15 minutes a day. It's actually relatively low. But the reason why I think this is a challenge, and this isn't anything personal for anyone here, I just think uh, without taking a poll and asking everyone individually, I think there's a lot of people that don't spend very much time at all in prayer. I think that's one of the things that's lacking in many people's lives. I think that's something that gets pushed off to the side a little bit too easily and people end up doing everything else first. And maybe they are doing pretty good about reading their Bible. Maybe you are doing pretty good about making sure you show up to soul winning times and coming to church. But I think too often prayer is one of those things that just kind of gets pushed off to the back burner. Maybe you wait until right before you go to bed and you start praying and you fall asleep every night. I don't know. It's something that, that I think is, is relatively common. I think people fall into that type of a trap and not dedicating and saying, no, I am actually going to set this time apart to speak to God. Now, what is prayer? Prayer, the word pray literally means just to ask. So when we're in prayer, we are asking God for things. Excuse me. Before we eat, sometimes we pray, we always give thanks though. So in my household, when we eat, we thank God for the food that we have. We thank him for blessing us. And we usually include other things that we ask. But there's a difference between just giving thanks to God. You're still speaking to him, but that's not necessarily a prayer. God, I thank you so much for providing this meal for us today. That is not a prayer. You're speaking to God. You're communicating with God. It's a good thing to do, but prayer is literally when you're asking for things. And what we are going to be doing is going to be praying as our prayer challenge to spend at least 15 minutes every day in prayer asking God for things. Now, one of the requirements included in our challenge, if you're wondering, well, what am I going to be asking God for within this 15 minutes? One of the things that you need to be asking or praying about is every single person in our prayer list. So our bulletins all contain the people that we are praying for. And we need to be praying for everybody on this list every single day. That's part of the prayer challenge. So if you're going to complete the challenge, you need to be praying for everybody on this list. Now, it doesn't have to be some extravagant, you know, perfectly worded prayer to God. God just, if you're praying from your heart, then you're praying right. And if you're praying according to God's will, you're praying right. So in all of these things, when we do pray, we want to, to make sure that God's will is done. So I always include that because sometimes we pray for things 
And um, we don't always know everyone's situation. And we think we understand what might be the best solution for a situation. So maybe someone is out of a job and they need employment. Maybe someone is going through some type of an illness and we think, well, hey, we want them to be healed, right? These are natural things that we think of, but we also want to just keep in mind, God, we want your will to be done above everything. Maybe somebody is going, is experiencing, you know, an illness and we're praying for them to be healed, but maybe they're being chastened by God. And if they're being chastened by God, we don't necessarily want to just kind of interfere with that, right? Now, God know the, knows these things, and we don't just assume that it, it's the worst. But what I like to do, and what I think is a good idea to do, when you're praying for things, say, God, you know, this person is, is having a hard time. We ask that you please heal them and help them. But, you know, whatever your will is, whatever could, good could come out of this, we want your will to be done, so we're praying that, you know, this can strengthen them, this can help get, if they're not right with God, you know, and kind of go into a little bit of detail on, on that and, and just keeping your, your motive with being in tune or in line with God. Um, and, and it's good to think about those things. And, you know, and, and I've brought this up in other sermons, but especially when there's people who are unsaved and you really want them to be saved, a family member or a friend, someone you've known for a long time, that you care about, you love them, but you want them to get saved, is sometimes you pray things that will, you know, if they're a little bit too comfortable, that will shake them up a little bit. That may not be a pleasant thing, but something that might be necessary to humble them enough to be able to receive Christ. That's, that's one of the things that you could be praying for as well. So you want to try to be a little bit creative and really put thought into people's situation, whatever the problem area is, whether it's illness or whether it's, you know, they're not saved or, or anything, whatever it is that, that you are focused in on a particular person about, think about them a lot, think about the situation and, and use that to help you with your word, your prayer to God. Now, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be exactly 100% perfect. God knows the thoughts and intents of our hearts, but we can't just get real lazy or sloppy and you say, well, God knows my heart, so I don't even have to pray anyways. That's just blowing it off. That is not the same thing as just saying, well, God knows my heart. No, he sees when you actually take the time and invest to speak to him. There are things that I may know that, let's say, my children want, but they're not going to get it unless they actually come and, and ask me for it. Even if I know they may want something, it's something that they have to at least show the respect and, and come and communicate with me and talk to me. Do you think I just want to have my children never talking to me? And I'm just always taking care of them. They never even come to me for anything and just, just they live their life and I live my life? Of course not. I'm, I'm there for my children. I'm trying to, to teach them and instruct them. And you know, with God, he's, he's, uh, he's the giver of all knowledge and wisdom too. So we ought to be in our own lives as we deal with struggles, going to God and asking him for, for wisdom, for and, you know, instruction, and that we'll be able to understand his words that he's given us here and, and going to him in that manner as well, is going to him as a resource, and a source of wisdom and knowledge for us. Now, um, I'm getting a little bit off track. Our prayer challenge, so the, here's a requirement so far. Pray for at least 15 minutes every day. Pray for every single person on our, on our list. We're praying for other people and, and, you know, pray for other people as well. Other people, you know, that may not be on our prayer list, of course, but just the, the requirements for our challenge is that I also want you to keep track of your prayers. So whatever prayers that you have, now you don't have to worry about the ones on our list. I'm going to be keeping track of that for the church and keeping you updated as, as much as I know on the status of, of these people. But any personal prayers that you include for yourself or for somebody else, this is a very important aspect and an important point. I'm not going to preach a lot on this, but keeping track of your prayers and when God answers them, if you don't keep track of things, the tendency is to forget how much God really is listening to you and how many prayers you really have had answers. And it, and it tends to lead to an attitude of being 
just not very diligent with it and not, and not caring as much and not thinking it's a big deal when you don't pray. But when you see that God really is listening, when you see all these answered prayers, it's humbling and we could thank God and, and, it, and it will make you feel even closer to the Lord just because you can see, wow, he's really blessing. Wow, he's really answered all my prayers. I've been asking for these things. And as you go through and check it off, you could just say, this is incredible. Now, it feels that way, at least, because it's not incredible. Of course, we could believe it because God's word says it. He hears the voice of his children. He hears us. He wants us to ask us for things. And the Bible says that over and over again. But we need reminders of that sometimes because, let's face it, it's not like you're, you're talking face to face with God. And when you don't have that, that physical sight, it becomes more of a challenge of your faith to keep doing something that you don't see necessarily the results of. And even though you do get results, if you're not paying attention to those results, it could slip by you and then we're not going to be as thankful as we ought to be to God for answering our prayers. So I really want you to keep track of your own prayers. Now, obviously, there's, there's different lengths of time sometimes before God answers us. And he doesn't always give us the result that we expect. But he will hear your prayers, especially if you're doing right. And I'm not going to get all that. So there's a lot of sermons I could preach about prayer and about making sure your prayers are heard. And we want to make sure they're in line with God's will, of course, because we shouldn't be asking for things outside of God's will. We also need to be keeping ourselves, you know, righteous and pure to the best of our ability and, and keeping on the right path because he's a lot more inclined to be listening to us when we're listening to him. If we go and ask God for help with something, why would he want to answer you when he's already given you instructions that you just toss to the side and you don't care about? So an example of that would be, you know, if I've already tell my children, you know, not to try and think, of, you know, not to do something where they might get hurt. I say, don't do that. Don't, don't, um, Don't stack up a bunch of chairs and, you know, and, 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 and climb on them because you, you're going to fall and you can warn them and warn them and you give them that instruction and then they do it anyways and then they come asking you for help. Oh, I climbed up here and I got stuck or whatever. You know, well, I told you already. You know, obviously with kids, and it's kind of a silly example because when they're real little and just completely ignorant, you, you, you're long-suffering and you help take care of those things. But as we grow with God, there gets a point to where it's like, no, you, you know, I've told you all these things and I don't want to just keep repeating myself. And if you come to me asking me for all this extra wisdom, I'm not going to give you any more. If you, if you already refuse to listen to the things I have to say, then I'm not going to continue to invest my time of just giving you a lot more wisdom because you've, you're already rejecting it. And when we don't read God's word, we're not hearing from him because you can't pray to God and expect to hear him answer you in like an audible voice. We have his word. He's already given us instruction. Now, the problem is that sometimes we don't always understand his instructions, but we ought to be opening up our ears and trying to hear from him and to receive what it is that we ought to be doing. And when you pray to God, God can open up the scripture to you and help you to find the areas where you're struggling with to be able to listen to him. But if you're not listening to some, maybe some of the real simple commands and his real simple instructions, and you're just saying, oh yeah, nah, I know the Bible says that, but, but I don't really want to do that. Then why, how in the world would you expect God to just be illuminating you and opening up your understanding about other areas? Well, I'm struggling here. I, I need this help. Yeah, I, I know God said that, but I don't have time for that or whatever. So to get your prayers answered, you need to be listening to God. And, um, and paying attention to that. So keep track of your prayers going all the way back now. I, I keep on getting off on, on these other areas of prayer. Uh, that, that They are very important. But the, the prayer challenge, pray for at least 15 minutes every day. Pray for every single person in our uh, bulletin, in our prayer list. Keep track of your prayers when God answers them. Just kind of make note of it. And if you are married, I want you to try praying with your spouse out loud. Now, it doesn't have to be for the entire time that you pray, but try doing this regularly. If you have conflicting schedules, you know, I'm not going to just completely discount you on the challenge, but this is something that actually 
Not only is it good to be praying together, but it's good for your marriage. When you pray out loud with one another, and especially if you're praying for one another, because I'll tell you what, I pray for my wife regularly, but there's an added benefit when your spouse knows that you're praying for them because they hear you praying for them. Because they're involved with you praying, you're praying for each other. That is going to bring you closer together. It's one thing to just kind of have this thought, yeah, I think he prays for me, or I know, you know, he says he prays for me. But when they actually hear you kind of pouring out your heart to God and, and praying for you, that brings you closer together. It's going to help you. And that helps both of you be more long suffering when you have friction, when you have fights, when you have arguments and things like that, because you know that your spouse loves you and is praying for you. So you have a lot of extra benefit for that. So that's kind of something I'm throwing in there. If you're married to, uh, to add that to your prayer life and then also to spend some time praying on your knees being humble. And, and of course, this is only applicable if it's, if it's physically possible, right? If you, if, you, if you have some serious problem where like you're going to damage yourself by getting on your knees, you know, that's not, you know, the, I'm not talking about that for you. But the, the point, maybe there's something else you can do. The point is to humble ourselves before the Lord when we go in prayer to him. Now, this is not a, for this particular challenge, this is not something I'm requiring every single time you pray. But what I want you to do is get used to the idea or the notion of humbling yourself and getting on your knees in prayer to God and recognizing who he is and recognizing who we are, that we don't speak to God and ask for things from God with a spoiled brat type of an attitude. There's a big difference when we go into our prayer with God humble, even in the things that we might be asking for. When we don't take the time to take a step back and realize who we're speaking to, we may have this tendency to get an entitlement type of an attitude when every little thing goes over. Say, yeah, you know, it's good to go to God when things go wrong, but when, we, when, when your smartphone is acting up on you, oh God, can you just make this thing work? You know, and you have this type of an attitude where it almost becomes just disrespectful and you're just treating God as just some genie in a bottle that's just there to answer all of your wishes and to just make everything extremely comfortable for you, then you've got a problem. That is not proper prayer. But when you're thinking about God and how powerful and glorious and magnificent God is and how awesome he is and, and all that he's done for us and how humble we ought to be that we should just be getting on our knees and praying, that might also impact some of the things that you're thinking about praying for and thinking a little bit more about the things that really matter and how you ought to be spending your time in prayer with God and how you ought to be speaking to God. So the focus of my sermon tonight, that's, that is the, the challenge outline. What the, I'm trying not to make it too difficult. In a nutshell, 15 minutes, pray for everyone on the list, and keep track of your prayers. Those are the main requirements. But I want you to remember to, be, to, to pray on your knees if you can, and if you're married, pray with your spouse also. So those are the, the requirements. If you do this every single day, you meet these requirements every day, at the end of the month, if you've done all that, then you'll earn a special prize just as we do for all of our other challenges. Now, um, we're going to, the, the topic of my sermon tonight is the humility of prayer. The humility of prayer, because you have to be humble to even ask for things. We started off reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I want you to look down again at verses number 6 and 7. The Bible reads, In these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? So the concept that he's getting across here 
one of the problems people say, oh, I'm of Paul and I'm a Paul. And they were lifting up certain men as if that makes them better because they're following this apostle and I'm following this disciple and I'm following this person and they're the best Christian. And just somehow thinking like they're getting real puffed up in who they're lifting up and getting puffed up in themselves and puffed up comparing themselves with each other. And the point that he's giving here is saying, well, wait a minute. What makes you better than anyone anyways? Because whatever you have, it's not something that you just completely earned on your own, that you've come up with all this great doctrine. No, you received it. You learned it from somebody else. And this is a problem, just on a side note, I've seen this happen even to people who, who may be well-intentioned at the beginning, especially, you know, they get saved and they start learning a lot and they start getting real proud and haughty because that little bit of knowledge that they've received, maybe it's not uh, the same thing that other people believe. They'll see other people that have been saved for a long time or even other pastors and they feel like, oh, I know so much more than this person because they don't even understand that, you know, Israel is, is actually anti-Christ. They're all pro, you know, so they get this attitude because someone may be wrong in a particular doctrine. And I've seen this happen way too many times where you have a brand new Christian. Someone's been saved less than a year saying this pastor's an idiot and that pastor's an idiot where the pastor's saved. Maybe they even go soul winning and they've been pastoring for 40 years and they're just blowing off their mouth and saying, well, he's just an idiot. He doesn't know anything. But you who's been saved for six months, you just know everything, right? Because the moment you got saved, you just understood all knowledge and all mysteries and you are just going to set everybody straight, right? No, they're forgetting that whatever it is that they know that they think makes them so smart they received from somebody else. They didn't come up with that on their own, but people like to throw off all this information as if it's all theirs, the result of all their study and hard work. No, you received it from someone else. And this was part of the problem that was going on there, but the, the concept that's being taught, he's saying, well, how can you glory about something that you've received? When we go to God in prayer, we're asking for things so that when we receive those things, you know, we can't be glorying about, let's say you are going through hardship. Maybe you have a serious illness and God heals you, right? You pray to God, you beg God, God, please help me. There's an area in my life I need help with, whatever it is. What we don't want to do then is let that turn into pride of thinking that somehow, oh, my own, my own power, you know, brought this healing or it's something that I did that, you know, like, and, and start to, to maybe feel like you get credit for what God has given to you instead of giving that honor and glory to God. Or, or you know, I think about this, you know, I personally have been looking for, for um, employment and if I'm praying to God every day for that, but then I go and say, oh, I landed this job because I'm so smart. And I, you know, like that would, be, that would be proud. That would be boasting instead of giving credit. God, I've been asking for this. God finally, you know, God answers my prayer. And then for me to just turn around and be like, oh yeah, it's, uh, uh, I'm so great. I did this or I did that. We need to be able to, to stay humble and be humility when we ask God for things that we also give him credit when those things come our way. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Just the act of going to God for something should be humbling. Just the fact that you're asking for something is, a, is an act of humility. Now, I think men have more of a hard time with this than ladies just by nature, the way that God designed us. Men, men have been designed by God to be leaders, to be self-sufficient, to, you know, to have certain qualities and attributes about them that, that they're going to work, they're going to provide, they're, you know, they're going to do all these things. Whereas ladies don't have all of those same attributes 
and were designed more to be led by their husbands and to, to serve in that manner. So uh, men have a harder time with this of going out and even asking for things because we want to be really, really independent. Now, I'm not saying no ladies have, this, have a similar issue, but with, with men, it's even more so. It's, it's more prone to be having that type of an issue of, of not wanting to ask anyone. It's, it's like, you know, asking for directions. I don't like asking for people directions. I like knowing where I'm going, and if I get lost, I'm going to figure it out. I don't want to stop and, and ask somebody else because in order to do that, you have to... You have to humble yourself to admit, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and then you have to actually allow someone else to know you don't know what you're doing, right? You, you don't know where you're at. Maybe you didn't prepare well enough, and maybe that's a little bit embarrassing. So it, it takes humility to ask for things. And when we go to God and ask for things in our life, you need to be humble because other, you, you, and you know what? We ought to be humble and not just say, well, I'm not going to bother. I knew someone once who just, said, well, I don't, I don't want to bother God with anything that I have. And he was trying to be noble in the sense that like, well, if I do something, you know, I got myself in a problem, whatever, I ought to pay for it. And a part of that, you know, that sentiment is, is right in the sense that, well, yeah, we're going to reap what we sow. However, God still wants us, you know, to go to him and to be looking for him. Sometimes when you get put in a very trying situation, it may be because God wants you to call on him. God wants you to just turn to him. And the, and the person I'm speaking about was not saved. Excuse me, was not saved at the time that I was having this conversation. It was a long time ago, probably about 20 years ago. He was not saved. And it's like, well, maybe the reason why all these, you know, you have all these problems and stuff is that God wants you to be humbled and to turn to him and just ask him for help. And the biggest help of all would be to turn to him and ask him to save your soul because guess what? You can't do it on your own. And that's the number one point of humility when we go to God in prayer is the humility of recognizing that you can't save yourself. So when it comes to salvation, you need to have a certain element of humility of asking God for a free gift in prayer. And this is why we use and believe in using the sinner's prayer when we preach the gospel to people. In order for a person to be saved, they have to be humble enough to accept the fact that they have sinned, that they have done wrong, first and foremost, that I have done wrong. I was not right in doing X, Y, and Z in my life. There's a punishment that I deserve to pay. That I am not as good as I might have thought I was. Recognizing I'm a sinner, understanding the condition and the result of that sin, and then having to ask somebody else to save me and get me out of this mess. Because this, the, the, the mess of sin and the, the punishment of hell is something you can't dig yourself out of. You can't do it. There is no way to overcome that. And being able to recognize that and call on God to save you and to ask for help is an act of humility. And that is something that is essential for any soul to be saved and go to heaven. If you don't have that, you cannot be saved and go to heaven. That is why the, you know, God hates a proud look. The Bible talks over and over again about pride and people who think that they are good enough, they're strong enough, they're capable of doing everything on their own. It is exactly against what the Bible teaches for salvation. Did I be turned to Romans 10? If I didn't turn to Romans 10, we're going to look at Romans chapter 10, which gives us an outline of people getting saved. And this is one of the, the best passages to show why it is scriptural to, uh, to, to teach and to um, use the sinner's prayer in leading people to asking God to be saved. We're start reading in verse number eight. The Bible says, but what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. 
And notice it says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. The word is in your mouth. Verse number nine, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. We're calling upon the Lord for our salvation. We are confessing the Lord with our mouth. We are asking God to save us. With our mouth, we are calling on him. Verse number 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And now we get the rundown of in order to have one thing, you have to have this, and it kind of goes back and back and back and back and back, just, just getting down to every aspect that is required for someone to get saved. In order to call on God, well, you have to believe on him. You're not going to call on the Lord if you don't already believe. You're not going to believe in anything if you haven't heard, right? He says, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? No one is going to decide to believe on Jesus if they haven't heard about Jesus and who he is and what he did. It's impossible. You're ignorant of it. And then how shall they hear without a preacher? You say, well, in order for people to hear about Jesus, someone needs to be preaching Jesus Christ. Someone needs to uh, be telling them about Jesus Christ. And then how shall they preach except they be sent? So in order, for, um, in order for people to hear, in order for the preacher to preach, they need to be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So basically we go through this backwards. We're in Romans chapter 10. If we go through this backwards, what we see is that there need to be people being sent out to preach and the preachers are preaching Jesus Christ to those who are going to hear. Those that hear then need to believe. And once they believe, they call on the Lord and get saved. And that's what Romans 10 is teaching here. And, and multiple times in this passage, we see you know, people calling on the Lord with their mouth. And what they're doing is they're praying. They are asking the Lord for something. Now, we have a, a habit of praying to God where we, we pray, you know, and this is something that I always do. You'll notice when I pray, and, and most people probably are similar, at least in the United States and in, in um, our types of churches, where we'll bow our head and close our eyes and probably like, fold our hands one way or another, put our hands together. And um, obvious, there's a lot of reasons for praying that way. A part of that is also humility. The reason why we bow our head is a form of humbling ourselves when we speak to God of, of you know, having this mentality of I'm not even worthy enough to lift up my hand. We'll get to scripture about that a little bit later. Um, you know, and keep our hands folded, just sign of respect and closing our eyes, not even lifting up our eyes unto God. So these are things that all things that we do to show humility before the Lord when we pray. But that doesn't mean that if you don't do those things, then you're not really praying to God, right? Because I've mentioned before, prayer is just asking God for something. I pray in my car sometimes, and I'll tell you what, I'm not closing my eyes and bowing my head when I'm driving my car. So <laughs> don't worry, I'm not doing all of those things. And God knows and understands that, but I'll, I'll, I'll pray, I'll talk to God, I'll ask him for things. And that is a legitimate prayer. You're, you're, you're asking God to help you for whatever need that you have. And in this specific situation, the first point about, uh, about you know, the humility of prayer is just the humility of, uh, in the prayer of asking God to save you, to save your soul. You need to be humble. We need, we need to humble ourselves at least to the point to recognize I'm not good enough and I'm going to ask God to save me. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 4. It's going to show you another couple of verses here. Just showing how scriptural it is about the teaching of, of asking God to save you and that that isn't adding works to salvation. Because people say, oh, you know, you're adding a work. If you have to pray, then you're, you're working for it. It's like, that's ridiculous. And John chapter 4 actually 
she will show us, Jesus will show us, that this is not a work. Just in the very concept. I mean, think about this. We're going to read the passage in a minute. But I'm going to give you an illustration. Let's say, you know, we're just going to use this book. And I go, Elizabeth, I have this gift. I bought this for you. I want you to have this gift. And you don't have to paint. You don't have to do anything for it. But if you want it, you have to ask me for it. Okay? Do you want this gift? Okay, you have to ask me for it. Go ahead. It's okay. We're, we're, we're doing an illustration. There you go. Would anybody say, oh, she worked for that gift. That's, that's not a gift. No way. She worked for it. I saw it. I mean, she broke a sweat when she asked for that, for that gift. That's ridiculous. But some people want to nitpick so, do, you know, so close and just say, no, 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 no. Now look, I do believe that it's our faith that saves us. You know, there's, there's many, many verses of the Bible that talk all about that. We need to have faith. But the, the point here that's being made and what I believe is that when you, with your heart, you believe you're going to call on the Lord. It's something that just, that, that happens. There'd be no reason not to. I know my own personal situation when I got saved, nobody had to lead me in prayer. I didn't get saved by a soul winner coming to my door. You know, like what we do, we go and knock on people's doors, we teach them Jesus Christ, we show them, you know, all, all the various points of, of the gospel and just, and try to make things really clear and help them understand. And then when people see that, they understand it, and they say, yeah, I believe that. Then we'll lead them, help lead them in a prayer to just to call on the Lord. That's very well structured and it's very scriptural. And we see that uh, the chain of events happening in Romans chapter 10. I didn't have anybody leading me or guiding me when I got saved. But I'll tell you this much. I know that the word was planted in my heart. And when I got saved, when I decided to believe on Jesus Christ, because I made a conscious decision to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, but in doing that, what I did was I called on God and asked Him to save me. And I can't tell you the exact words that I used. And I'll tell you what, I didn't even do it with my mouth, but I definitely did it in my heart. God knew, knows the thoughts of our heart. And, and when I asked him to save me, it was genuine. Sincere. And I know, I know for a fact, this, I'm never going to change on that. I know when I got saved. And the belief and the calling on God was like simultaneous. I knew I needed a Savior. I put my faith in Christ and I called on the Lord. And then people say, oh, well, this says with your mouth. So it means you didn't do it with your mouth. You know, it's like you're totally missing the point what's been done there. And I think part of the, the point here in the message is that we're praying to God, we're asking him in humility to save us. Just like the thief on the cross did with Jesus Christ. He didn't do any good works, but when he, but when he believed, he called on Jesus and he said, hey, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. His, his belief came out through his mouth in calling on Jesus Christ to save him, and he did. He asked for that salvation, and he received it. We're going to see the same concept being given in John chapter 4. So if you look at verse number 9 in John chapter 4, this is the story of the woman at the well. Jesus talks to this woman. You know, she, she's a Samaritan woman, and at that time, the Jews were, didn't really have dealings with the Samaritans. They didn't talk to each other. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans as kind of a... a, a I don't want to say subhuman, but you know, it's an it's a inferior people. And look at verse number nine. The Bible says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Remember, Jesus was sitting at the well. She came with a bucket to go draw some water. And Jesus says, Hey, you know, give me a drink. So now she's like, Well, wait a minute. You're a Jew. Why are you asking me for a drink? So, which I'm a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Look at verse number 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked 
of him, and he would have given thee living water. So you're saying if, if you knew who I was, that's asking you for a drink, and if you knew what the gift of God is, he says, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give it to you. You would be asking me for that gift, and I would give you living water. He's likening, he's using this situation and applying it to salvation. So if you know what the gift of God, and we know what the gift of God is, it's eternal life. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. If thou knewest the gift of God, thou wouldest have asked of him. Now, Jesus is referring to a gift and he's saying you would ask for it. That doesn't change the fact that it's a gift because uh, you know, people who want to say, oh, you asked for it, that's like a work. You worked for it. So it can't be a gift because you earned it. Not according to Jesus. Jesus said if you ask for a gift, you're not, you're not earning it because it's still a gift. And he's saying, I would give it to you. And ultimately, what, it, what this is boils down to is it's not G the gift. Jesus isn't going, here, take this, and just slamming it into your hands and forcing you to take the gift. It's, still, it's your choice. Everyone has the choice to receive the gift. But he's saying, you've got to ask for it. I'm only going to give it to you if you want it, and you have to ask for it. Verse number 11, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Just further illustrating, he's talking about salvation. He's saying, you should be asking me for this the spiritual water of everlasting life and asking for that free gift. And in order to ask for that, like I said, we have to recognize that we need it, we can't do it on our own, and we have to humble ourselves and ask God for that in prayer. The, uh, it, it, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 11. But Psalm 116, 13 says, I will take the cup of salvation, referring to being saved, right, salvation, and call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord, praying unto God to be saved is completely biblical, it's scriptural, it's something that we practice here. It's not a work. You know, we don't need to get hung up on, on all the, you know, on the stuff. But it is something that we do and believe in here. We take, you know, and, it, and it's something that is humbling. So continuing on here, of course, the topic is, is the humility of prayer. We need to acknowledge, when, when you acknowledge that you need the help and you can't do everything on your own, that is in itself humbling. And we have to remember that our Heavenly Father loves us and He actually wants us to rely on Him. He wants us looking to Him and going to Him for help. In Luke chapter 11, we're going to see um, a model prayer here. It's a, you know, it's a version of the, of the Lord's Prayer here that... that you know, many people will chant, even though the Bible tells us not to use vain repetitions, not to just repeat things. So, you know, when we pray, it ought to be coming from your heart. You're praying in a certain way unto God, but you don't just chant a prayer and think that somehow that's going to do something for you. The point of the prayer is, is to be in communication with God and to ask Him for the things that you need, not to just repeat something that you've read or seen before. It's something that you, you are looking for from God. But let's start reading here in verse number one. We'll see this a little bit more clearly. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. So the beginning of his prayer, it's going to be starting off in humility, just in the fact that you're recognizing who you're speaking to. Our Father, you're in heaven, and your name is hallowed. It's holy. It's respected, right? The very beginning in communicating with God ought to be in a manner that is very respectful and, and 
keeping in mind who we are speaking to. As, I, as I've mentioned before, that, that it's very important to be humble when we approach God. That we don't just treat Him as somebody, you know, that, that you can just say whatever to because that's not that relationship. And unfortunately today too, you know, it's just the, the families are getting kind of turned on their head with the way that relationships ought to be between parents and children. Too many parents these days, and, and it's way more prevalent among the divorcees, the people who, who aren't married anymore that want to feel some type of a connection with their child, and they want to be real hip and cool, and they treat them more like a friend than they do as a child. And the reason why I say it happens more often with people who are divorced is because they want to gain the affection of their child over their ex-spouse. They want to feel like they're more loved. They want to gain more of their child's attention and love than over their spouse because you're no longer together and unified in a family. When you divorce, you separate, and now you've got odds with each other, and you're, and you're, not, you're not in unity raising your child. So as a result, way too many times you have parents then who are doing whatever they can to try to you know, gain that affection, whether it be spoiling them through buying everything that they want or letting them get away with things because they want to be the cool parent that their child wants to spend more time with and being more permissive and not disciplining appropriately and getting this temporary satisfaction of having this extra time with them when you're going to be destroying your child's future because you're not raising them in a proper environment. You're letting them get away with too much stuff and you're not disciplining them when they need it. Now, it's not just divorced families that even happens in married families where people want to be real trendy and cool and kind of feel like they're on their level of a teenager. Well, as a parent, you shouldn't be on the level of a teenager. You ought to have wisdom. You ought to be able to instruct your child. Now, every teenager is going to have their own issues and they're going through their problems. And you should know that as being a teenager yourself, that they're going to want to be more independent. They're going to think that they know everything when they don't. But as the adult, as the parent, your job is to make sure you do what's right for them, whether they like it or not. That is what's called being a parent. I think about my friend, hey, your buddies are always on your side, right? Oh, yeah, I don't know why your parents, they're mean. I don't know why I do all that stuff. You're going to be buddy. You know, when you got a buddy, that's the way you deal with a buddy. You can't be that way with a child. And when we pray to God, he's not our buddy. He's our father, which is why we humble ourselves and we ask for the things that we need very humbly. I don't know what would happen in my family if my children started to just treat me like I'm somebody when they come and ask me for things. It, it would shock me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I would do because I'd just be in shock. My jaw would probably drop open like, what did you just say? Because <laughs> that's not the way that things run in our house. Because I try to be a parent. To my, do I love my children? You bet I do. Do I spend time with them? Can we have fun together? We can. We can have very good time and have great relationship, but I'm always going to be their parent. And I'm not their buddy or their friend. I am someone they can confide in and trust and, and you know, all those good things, but I'm not their friend. I am their parent. And, and people need to get that. It's, it's lacking so much in today's society. People are just, are just destroying their children's future, I think, without even realizing it for that, that temporary satisfaction of the moment. Let's keep reading here in Luke 11. Verse number 2 is, is where we left off, right at the beginning of, of this prayer. And what he's doing, you know, what they ask them is, hey, teach us how to pray. They're not saying teach us every single word that we have to repeat over and over and over again. It's just how, how do we do it? How, how should we be praying to God? So he gives them an example of how you pray. He starts off saying, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. So right now in heaven, God's will is done. People aren't sinning and everything else in heaven. 
things are done the way God wants them to be done in heaven. But on earth, things aren't all being done the way God wants them to be. There are all kinds of things going on. But our prayer is that whatever we're asking for, God, we want your will to be done here. We want what's right happening here. So again, we're, we're laying this foundation of God. We want your kingdom to be here. Your kingdom is great. We want things to be done and patterned and modeled after the way they are in heaven so that your will would be done here. Um, verse number three, give us day by day our daily bread. So now we're getting to the point where we're asking for something. God, please provide for me. Give us our bread. And notice, he's saying, give, it, give us day by day our daily bread. Not give us day by day our, our, our daily caviar, right? <laughs> or our daily, you know, lobster and shrimp and steak. Daily bread. What do we need to sustain us? Bread and water, right? Just, God, please give us what we need. We thank you when, when you bless us and give us a lot more, but what we're asking for is what we need. We're not just going and asking for, for way more and, and acting like the spoiled child. We're just asking to, for God to fill our necessities. God, please, please give us what we need. Verse number four, and forgive us our sins. Again, more humility, recognizing that we do wrong, asking for forgiveness, asking for mercy. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, help, help us to, to walk the right path and, and to not let us get involved in areas where we shouldn't and, and God, keep us safe from evil. Verse number five, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves. So that, that's his sample prayer, right? It's a shortened version of, of what we find in Matthew chapter uh, six with the, with the Lord's prayer, but it's, you know, it's still an example prayer, but we're going to keep on reading here because there's some more uh, details I want to get into in this passage. Verse number five, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in, in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. So this example that he's given is, you know, this guy's friend, he comes over, it's real late at night, he's like, man, I'm already in bed, I'm not going to give you anything. But his importunity means he's not leaving. Like, come on, I need this, you know? And he's just like, hello, wake up. You know, like, give me, I need this bread. I got someone visiting me. Come on, man, get up. So what he's going to do is say, fine, okay? He's not getting up because he's his friend because they already said, look, I don't want to give it to you, right? If he was doing it just because he was his friend, you say, oh, okay, yeah, you jump up and you get it to him. But he's saying because of his importunity because he's not, you know, it's like, fine, I'll just satisfy him here. Take the bread and go right? But he's going to relate this. That's just an illustration. And he's going to relate this then to us asking God for things. Now, of course, God is, is way better than this friend that doesn't really want to help his friend, that he's just going to do it just to satisfy him. And um, there's another example in the Bible. It's not in this passage where it's the same thing about the unjust judge, where this woman goes to the judge and she's like, you know, she has this just cause and she wants the judge to rule in favor of her and just to help her out with her problem, with her situation. And the judge doesn't want to do it, but she keeps going to him and just asking over and over. And he's just like, fine, you know, if I don't do something, then she's just going to keep coming back. So just to satisfy her, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll rule. Now, he wasn't a just judge because a just judge should rule right just because it's right. But it's another example given of this is how you can get things in this world, right? You, you'd be persistent and you keep, keep looking after that. But he's saying God is even better than that because we can go to God even once and he'll hear us. And look at verse number nine here. We're going to keep reading. And he says, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. 
For everyone that asketh receiveth. What a great promise. He says, ask, it'll be given to you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Now, obviously, these things are kind of ridiculous, right? If, you're, if my child comes to me and says, Dad, can I have an egg? There's no way I'm giving her a scorpion, right? There's, this is not going to happen. So he's using this very illustratively to just say, you know, well, you know how to treat your children. You know how to give good things to them. They come and ask you, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Can I have an egg? Can I have this? You know, you're not going to just turn around and, and you know, give them a, a serpent or a scorpion. He says, if ye then being evil... Because we're not, right? You know, we do bad things. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And he's giving us this illustration of God, you know, hearing our prayers. And how much better is he? So we can have the confidence in our prayer. But as we saw already earlier, we want to maintain our humility when we go to God in prayer and ask him for things and God will hear us and he's going to give and when you ask, you're going to receive. And that's a promise that's given to us. Now, don't take that the wrong way. There's the, the prosperity gospel preachers out there that'll tell you, you know, that God's going to give, you know, you, you send in $100, we'll give, you know, God will give you $1,000. They don't say we'll give it to you because... Right, then, then that would be false advertising. They just want your money. But they try to tell you, oh, God's going to bless. He's going to turn all this. So he's going to give you, give us, give us one. He's going to give you tenfold back. And they make all these empty promises. Look, God's not here to make us rich in this life with the world's riches. That is not according to God's will. That's not the way things are done in heaven. So we can't expect for that to be the way that we're just going to treat God. Again, like he's our genie in a bottle. You got three wishes. Just ask God for anything. No. We, we need to be asking for things according to his will. God's, when you see, you know, the Bible says that it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Who wants riches? Seriously, who wants it? That's not what we need. That's not what we should be focused on. And if you are focused on that, that's not according to God's will. And God's not just going to be you know, that's not what he's referring to. That, that would be more like giving your child a scorpion instead of an egg. Now, if you are just completely down and out and you need a little bit of help, you know, you go to God for that. You ask for your daily bread, that's different. But when you're saying, I need a mansion, I need a million dollars, God, come on, help me out. Him actually answering that prayer by giving you those things would be more damaging than anything else. People's lives actually get ruined more by just getting tons of money and wealth. Now, not everyone that's wealthy will just automatically have a horrible life, but it's just, it's part of our human nature. We end up doing things and making foolish choices, especially when you get, you know, when, when there's more money involved. And people have more of a tendency to kind of live for self when, when you just have all this stuff instead of worrying about other people. Um, Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. God wants us to go to him. In order to do that, we have to be humble. We have to recognize, hey, I have a burden. I've got a load, a workload here. I've got, I've got stress. I need God to help me. But when we go to God and we cast our burden upon the Lord, we, we tell him about our problems, he will sustain us. He'll help us to get through those times. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. We're almost done tonight. 2 Chronicles chapter number 6. I wanted to go into this a little bit more in depth. I'm going to um, read for you from Daniel chapter 6. We're going to see a few examples of people praying on their knees. Now, as we're talking about our, our prayer challenge one of the things that, that I think we have a tendency to forget about, besides even just praying to God and, and dedicating time to pray to God, is 
being humble in our prayers and even doing something like getting on your knees. I mean, just think about it. For your, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but just think in your own mind, when was the last time I got on my knees and prayed to God and asked him for something? Because that's something that is being lost, I think, even in our culture and among churches. I mean, it's not something you have to do out in public, but when you pray in private, how do you pray? Right? How are we doing that? And it's, and it's something that we see many good examples of in Scripture of great men of God humbling themselves and getting on their knees. This was a habit for Daniel. I mean, think about how righteous Daniel is. I love Daniel. He's, he's a great man of God. He did so many great things. He stood for great things. You know, he, he, he was solid. He was dependable. He was faithful. He didn't waver. When, you know, no matter who he was confronted with, he maintained the course and did what was right. But he also was a very humble man. He was elevated, actually, to a great position. In the kingdom, King Nebuchadnezzar lifted him up when he was able to give, you know, interpret the dream of the king and he raised him up to be in a super high position in the kingdom and made these other people jealous and they're trying to bring him down and they're trying to do whatever they can, right? And that's when the story of, of Daniel getting cast into the lion's den because he didn't obey the king's commandment. Where, the, where they caused the king to put forth a commandment that you can't pray to God unless you get permission from the king first. And Daniel's like, I'm not doing that because I don't need to do that. I'm obeying God. I'm not going to ask man if I can pray to God. And, but one of the things that he did, and what we see through that story, I'm going to read for you from Daniel 6, verse number 10, is that Daniel, in his prayers, on a regular basis, was getting on his knees. Daniel 6.10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that law went into effect, he went into his house, and his windows being open, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, didn't, didn't change his habit at all. He knew that it was a death, death sentence if he got busted. Does that mean he closed his windows? No. Nope. Windows being open, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. Talk about the humility of Daniel. That'll help keep us humble. Three times, not just once. I mean, how often do you even pray to God? Daniel's getting on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Nothing changed, even when confronted with, you know, breaking the law. He did it before, and he's going to keep doing it. But Daniel got on his knees before God three times a day and prayed to God. It's a great example. Great man of God to follow, especially in this area. You're in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse number 13. We're going to start reading. This is about Solomon. Now think about Solomon. Solomon inherited this great kingdom from his father David. Right? This is a time period now. David had fought a lot of wars. There was a lot of battles. Solomon now is taking over the kingdom, and it's going to be this great time of peace and prosperity. And God has blessed Solomon with all this great wisdom that he's given more to him than anyone that was before him. He's also granted him wealth and prosperity, and he's given him all of these things. So you have this man that at this point in his life was very righteous, because he didn't allow those things to get to his head and to puff him up. We're going to see him actually here getting on his knees and praying before his whole kingdom, getting on his knees and praying to God. Verse number 13, the Bible says, For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold. So he's lifted up above the people. You know, a lot of people, it makes sense to be on a podium, you know, up, up above to be able to, to have everyone hear you and stuff. It says a five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high. And had set in the midst, excuse me, and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth. What's he doing? He's giving honor and respect and praise unto the Lord as he's on his knees and just beginning his prayer to God. He says, which keep his covenant and show us mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. And he continues on and on and on. And you can read the rest of his prayer. We're not going to get into all that tonight. But how does he start? He starts on his knees and giving glory and respect to God. The reason why I'm going into all this stuff is I want us 
as we go through, because I want the prayer to be effective. It's not something that we're checking off a list of doing this challenge. That's not the point. The point isn't to say, okay, I've got a timer running and as soon as 15 minutes runs up, I'm just checking it off and I'm done. That is not, if you're doing that, you're totally missing the point. I want your prayer life to be effective. I want you to get closer to God. I want your life to be changed as a result of this prayer challenge. And that's why I'm bringing up the fact that we ought to be humble before our Lord. We ought to at least sometimes invest time in getting down on our knees before the Lord. And when we, and when we begin our prayers, just recognize who we're speaking to and give Him honor and give Him glory and give Him praise before we start going into the things that we need from Him. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 5. is the last place I'll have you turn. I'm just going to read for you from Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9 is where, is where we get our practice of just bowing our heads when we pray. It's a biblical thing to do. I say it's not just a cultural thing. It's something that we do for a good reason. Ezra 9 verse number 5, the Bible says, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees. So here's again, he's, he's, he's getting on his knees to pray. I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up into the heavens. So the, you know, this, this is a humility of just saying, God, we are sinners. I can't even lift up my, my, my face to kind of look up to thee. I don't want you to see my face because we've sinned so greatly. We're ashamed. And we also see the example of the, um, the Pharisee in the temple. And then the, I believe it was like a publican, right? They were praying. And he goes, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. He's like, I, I fast three times a week. I pray. I do all, you know, I thank you, God, that I'm so great. And that I'm such a great guy. It was basically this guy's prayer. And then the other guy, the publican, He's, it, the Bible says that he would not so much as raise his, his, his eyes, you know, raise his face up to heaven, but, he's, but he, you know, he beat on his chest and said, God, be merciful to me. And the Bible says that that man went away justified and not the other guy, the guy that, that was humble and wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. That is why we bow our heads. It's, again, it's, it's a sign of respect and it's a sign of humility from us when we speak to God. Matthew chapter 5, the last place we're going to look at is one more example of being humble when we pray because here we have the example of praying for people that do you wrong. That requires a lot of humility. It takes a little bit of humility just to turn to God and ask him for things in your own life, things that you recognize, hey, I'm not able to do this, God. I need help. I need somebody to help me out with this because I can't do it. That requires humility. You need to be able to just, just recognize there's something greater than me. I need your help. Asking for help requires humility. But going above and beyond that, let's look at Matthew 5, verse number 43. The Bible says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So he's asking, he's, he's telling us, not just asking, he's saying, you know, you need to pray for the people that despitefully, you know, despitefully, they don't care about you at all. They're using you. People who despitefully use you, they persecute you. So pray for those people. That's a humility pill to swallow. When you can accept 
that against you and then still be able to pray for them. But that's what we're being told to do. Do good to those that hate you. We overcome evil with good. That's what God does. Now, God's a judge. God, God will right the wrongs anyways. But the way that he wants us to act is to do good. He wants us to be able to pray for people and, and even praying for people that use you. That is a great act of humility. But think about it. We don't, I mentioned it this morning, we, we, don't, we don't deserve God's love. The sins that we do and breaking his commandments, we, we don't deserve it. You know, we, we deserve a punishment. But God has chosen to grant us mercy and to show his love unto us and that even though we don't deserve it, he still loved us anyways. So when people use us and, and, and persecute us, do they deserve our love or our prayers? No. But we become more Christ-like when we can be humble enough, as Christ was humble enough to go up on the cross and, and pay a debt that he didn't owe out of love. When we can just pray for someone else that does bad things for you, that persecutes you. It's an act of humility. As we go into this month, I hope that we get everyone to participate. It's not asking very much. 15 minutes of your life every day for this month. Spend in prayer to God. Pray for the people on our, on our prayer list. Pray for all of them. These are almost every single person on this list. I've gone and I've trimmed it down a little bit. I mentioned this morning. Um, th these are all people that if you don't know personally, you can talk to me. But this isn't a huge list. But even if it gets bigger, if there's, if there's more needs, we'll add them to this list. But we want to pray for everyone on this list. And when you, what you're going to notice is you're going to find yourself probably asking more about them because you're spending time praying for them. You're going to be thinking about them. And you're going to be more concerned about how are things going because you actually are praying for them. And it's a good thing. And it's something that we want to do. It's something that we're, we're, I'm challenging you to do. It's going to help our church. And it's definitely going to help these people that, that have their names on this list. And that's the point. Prayer is powerful. I didn't go into any of that this morning. We know that prayer is powerful. There's so many examples, a multitude of examples in Scripture about God doing things simply because people prayed. They asked for it. There's things that God won't do just because we're not asking for it. Let's ask. Let's go to God in prayer. He says, ask and you shall receive. Let's, let's, let's hold God to his word on that. Respectfully, humbly, let's, let's practice getting on our knees at home and, and, and praying before God. You know, no one's going to see that. I'm not going to see you getting on your knees and praying, but God does. God sees that, and that's who matters. That's who we're praying to. It's not about what anyone else sees. That's why we don't worry about the, the real fancy words that we use when we pray to God, because God understands our heart. We're not here to impress anyone else, not here to make long prayers, so everyone hears how great of a prayer person you are. No, nope, we're going to go to God with our needs, and we're going to do it humbly. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you hear us, that, that you are a God that will, will hear our prayers and, and listen to us, dear Lord. God, um, I pray that you please help us. I, I think one of the biggest problems that people might have is just remembering to, to have this added to their schedule. And God, I pray that you would please stir up our spirits and help us to not be negligent in this area, that, that we can all become um, better at, at praying and communicating with you and, and asking you for things. Lord, we, we, um, we love you and we have the utmost respect for you, Lord. We thank you for the, the gift of our salvation, the gift that we don't deserve, but that you've freely given unto us and pray that you please help us and, and strengthen us, Lord, to do the, the tasks that you have laid out for us to do and um, God, we love you, and I pray that you please just, just bless this, 
this challenge that we're, we're embarking on this month. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.